What is a portfolio? Essentially, it's a large, thin, flat case of loose sheets of paper, such as drawings and other artwork. But the modern portfolio is a digital collection of photographs, movie clips, electronic documents, and other relevant media that are well organized in a clear and effective way. In this video, we will demonstrate all the steps that you're going to need to follow in order to create a portfolio and get this done efficiently. This might seem like a trivial act or something that you can put off until later, but it's not. Your portfolio is a record of your creative life and your career. It is the sole form of communication of what you have made and should demonstrate your creative abilities. A portfolio is used in so many different ways and contexts that it is a critical part of what you need to do as a visual artist. So if you make creative stuff, you need to document it, especially before you sell it. With a portfolio, you can apply for gallery shows, grants, and scholarships. With these images and the content, you can build a website and sell your work. If you don't have a portfolio, you can't do any of these things. The first big step in creating a portfolio is consolidating all of the work that you've documented and not documented. This means finding all of the old photographs that you've taken, finding the scans and anything else that relates to your portfolio, and bringing it all together in one place, and then organizing it and labeling it. Once you know all of the things that you've documented, you can compare that against the giant pile of things you probably don't have documented and start the documentation process there. You may want to go back and redocument work if you still have it of, you know, to match the recent images that you just shot, but you want to make sure you get through the undocumented work first. So here's what it means to have documented work. If you have a good image of a particular piece of art, craft or design and the quality and the resolution are high enough you can consider that work well documented however if you don't have an image of a particular piece then it's undocumented and should be documented for your portfolio it's important that you document as much of your artwork as possible for your portfolio digital images are free and there's really no excuse for not taking time to document your creativity even though you might not share most of it with the world your portfolio is the visual part of your curriculum vitae in that you have an entire course of life captured through a series of images that represent all the things that you've created. The part of your personal portfolio that you show to the world is a curated collection designed to show the best of your creativity and talents and demonstrates what you're able to do. However, it's important that you have a personal portfolio that you can look through that shows you all the things that you've ever done without having to dig through boxes, cardboard folios, and sketchbooks to find them. Okay, so now that you have two piles of work, the documented and the undocumented, you should sort through and organize it based on the different types of documentation that you will require. For instance, all of the flat two-dimensional work that is tabloid size or smaller can be scanned on a flatbed scanner. Scanners are overall faster and better than trying to take a picture with a camera. So make a pile for scanning. Some images that are larger can be scanned in two parts and stitched together on a computer, so keep that in mind if you want to try it. Now that the work is sorted and you know what work has to be documented using a camera or a scanner, let's learn how to set up the camera. In this demonstration, I'm going to be using a Canon digital single lens reflex camera that has interchangeable lenses and the ability to shoot through the back using something called Live View. Now, many of you might be familiar of, with Live View because you operate your cell phone camera that way. Essentially, when you look at the back screen, what you see is what you get. With a digital single lens reflex, you have the ability to compose and focus the image through the viewfinder, which is a direct reflection of what the camera lens sees. There's no translation through a video screen to distort or alter the image. While I prefer to compose my images through the viewfinder, many people are more comfortable using live view as that's what they have on their cell phones. Modern digital cameras have become extremely sophisticated and complicated devices that are capable of taking amazing photographs with simply the press of a button. The ability for the camera to automatically determine the correct exposure, focus area, proper white balance, and a whole host of other settings is simply remarkable. However, when you're working with automatic settings, you're giving complete control over to the camera. To document work effectively, 
Using a camera, you will need to adjust the various controls in order to manipulate the focus and get the depth of field in the photograph needed in order to accomplish proper images of your artwork. So let's go over the steps that go into taking a photograph and we'll elaborate on these various features and operations that you'll need to perform to get the camera to do what you want. So here's what happens when you turn on a camera and take a photograph. The camera goes through a series of rapid calculations to determine the amount of light to let into the camera, the duration of the exposure, where to place the focus, and all this happens before it actually even takes the picture. This is referred to as the metering and focusing. After it's done these two steps, the camera will go through operations of the photographic exposure. Once the focus is locked on, the camera will set its opening and the aperture to just the right size to let in the exact amount of light. Then it opens the shutter inside the camera, exposing the sensor to light for the exact amount of time needed, and then closes the shutter with a second click. The sensor sends all of this information through the camera's computer and writes it to the media card, and all of this happens so quickly that all we really hear is a couple of noises and a click. So what's the first thing you should do when you pick up a camera? Not sure? Well, most people say, turn it on. However, I recommend that before you do anything with the camera that you put the strap around your neck or around your hand if you happen to be walking or running. The strap method is the best way to prevent you from accidentally dropping your camera and breaking it. Modern cameras are quite delicate and can be broken very easily with not much more than a bump, so treat them delicately. Now it's safe to turn on the camera. We can check to see if the batteries are charged. Okay, so there's a little thing I need you to do if the camera doesn't turn on or appear to be working. So if you turn it on and the screen's black and it still focuses and seems to take a picture, it could be that the display button on the back has been turned off. So activate that button and you'll see if the display screen comes on or not. If the camera still doesn't appear to turn on at all, you can be pretty sure that the battery is completely depleted. So if you need to take the battery out, you're going to turn it upside down and remove the battery out of the compartment here by opening the compartment and then releasing the little gray catch that holds the battery in place. And uh, don't get too excited about uh, the battery just yet, but make sure you want to close the gate before you do much more. Otherwise, it is possible to set the camera down with the gate open and it will crack. Uh, once you get the battery out of the camera, then you want to insert the battery into the charger with the contacts facing in and then plug that into the wall. Now, while you have it powered on, you can check to see how many photos you can take on the lower right hand part of the screen. There's a number inside of the brackets that will illustrate the number of photographs you can take before you will run out of space. If the screen looks, you know, like this, <clears throat> and you get a symbol that says no card in camera, or you turn it on, the first time and it looks like this, then you probably don't have a card in the camera. So you can get a card pretty much anywhere at uh, any local camera store or office supply store. An 8 or a 16 gigabyte card is about the right size for what we need and it'll get you through a few sessions of documentation. Once you confirm that there's space on the camera card and the camera is now uh, ready to get set up, so we want to look for the resolution and the file type in the camera's menu. And the image quality setting is the first menu that you come to and it's in red. There's a series of other menus that are colored blue, yellow, and green, but the one that you want is the first one in red. And you can access that by pressing the thumb pad on the back of the camera. When you're in the image quality menu, I recommend that you use the RAW plus JPEG setting. Raw files are essentially like an old-fashioned digital negative and a JPEG is kind of like a print. So now you've discovered 
uh, through your explorations that there's a lot of menus and features that can become confusing when you're learning about how to operate a camera. There's a few concepts that we need to go over to help you understand how to run a camera successfully. So cameras are sensitive much like our eyes, except they can be adjusted to be more or less sensitive. To set your camera sensitivity, you need to locate the ISO button on the back of the thumb pad and adjust it. The ideal sensitivity for documentation would be between 100 and 400 ISO depending on the lighting conditions. Higher ISO values create an undesirable effect that's called noise. Noise is often referred to as a grain or a textured look that you can see when you look at your photographs closely. If you want to see what I mean, set your camera to 400, 800, 1600, 3200 ISO, the highest value it'll go, and zoom in as far as you can go and you'll see it on the screen. Once the ISO is set, it stays locked in at the value that you set it at until you change it. So it's set at the same value as the last person that used it. So if you're picking the camera up for the first time, don't assume that the ISO is set correctly. Always check to make sure that it is set to the value that you want. Besides the sensitivity or the ISO of the camera, there are two main adjustments that the camera uses to control the speed and the amount of focus present in the photograph. These adjustments are referred to as shutter speeds and apertures. Shutter speeds are the interval of time that the shutter is open and exposing the sensor during the photograph. This is the familiar click of the camera. The aperture, which is actually located inside the lens, is how the camera controls the amount of light that comes into the body. It's similar to our eye in that it can widen and narrow and let in more or less light. And the balance of these two features, the aperture and the shutter speed, is what allows the image to be controlled and exposed properly in the back of the camera. It used to be a piece of film back there, but it's, now it's a digital chip with millions of red, green, and blue sensors that work like rods and cones in our eyes. It's truly amazing. The angle of view is primarily controlled by adjusting the zoom feature on the camera lens. This is accomplished by adjusting the zoom in one direction to widen the field of view and then rotate it in the other direction to narrow the field of view. The field of view can also be adjusted by changing the height and tilt of your camera lens. So why does all this stuff about zoom matter? Essentially what it boils down to is the fact that at a wide angle lens, or the wide angle part of your lens, it's going to distort and alter the way your images look, and they're gonna look weird. For instance, if you photograph a square object with a wide angle setting, it's gonna bow out the edges and make it look like your paper was cut funny. As you zoom in towards 55 millimeters, it removes these distortions and flattens things out, and you get a much better representation of what your artwork actually looks like. Once you've adjusted the camera lens to the optimal angle and view and set the ISO and the shutter speed and the aperture, you're ready to focus the camera and take the picture. There's basically two types of focus on most DSLR camera. There's manual focus where you adjust the front of the lens and then there's autofocus where you allow the camera to focus for you. The difference between these two modes is pretty evident, but one allows for control, where fully manual focusing, and then the other one allows for precise measurement because the camera has a really good autofocus mechanism and will lock onto things really well. So uh, it's up to you which one you use, but what I want to tell you is that if you're going to use autofocus, make sure the switch is turned on or it won't work. And then if you want to use manual focus, make sure that you turn the switch to M. You don't want to try to overpower the motor while it's engaged with electricity because you can damage the lens. So make sure that if you're going to manually focus the lens, stop, switch the, the mode to MF, and then it should move freely with no resistance. There's numerous types of autofocus modes that you can read about in the camera's manual, but for the purpose of documenting artwork, the single autofocus point is the best mode. And you're gonna access that through the AF button on the trackpad on the side of the camera, and it's called One Shot. Then you're going to activate 
the autofocus mode by pressing down the front trigger button about halfway and then the camera will autofocus and then beep. The one-shot mode allows you to set the location of where the camera will attempt to focus and then the focus will be placed on that spot giving you some control over the operation. You can move the autofocus point around to various parts of the viewfinder to control exactly where the camera is focusing. Most lenses, however, have a focus limit, which means that they can only focus so close to an image. And if you get too close, they just can't focus. So you got to be careful that uh, if the camera's not focusing, it might not be that it you know, it's having a problem focusing, but it's probably that you're too close to the image. So if your camera is struggling to focus on something, it could be because you cannot see the object because you're too close. Try backing up a little bit to see if the camera will refocus properly. While there are numerous different types of shooting modes located on the top option dial on the camera, there are essentially three that are useful for documentation of artwork. Manual, aperture priority, and shutter priority. The depth of field is the amount of focus that is shown in the photograph. So when a camera focuses on a certain area in a photograph, it extends the focus outwards from this area based on the aperture value that the camera was set to. This is illustrated here in the two photographs, the one on the left showing a narrow or shallow depth of field, and the one on the right demonstrating a larger depth of field, where the entire photograph is in focus. To shallow the depth of field, you must use smaller aperture values like f2 or f4 or 5.6. If you want to extend the depth of field out over the entire photograph, you should move your aperture values from f8 to f16, f22 or f32, and this will give you a larger depth of field in the photo. AV or the aperture value setting is the most useful for documentation of artwork. It's either shown with an A or an AV on the top of the mode dial. This mode uses a priority setting that balances the shutter speed based on the aperture value that the operator chooses. With this mode, the camera determines the correct exposure while prioritizing depth of field over shutter speed. TV or the shutter speed priority mode on the option dial works in the same way as the other priority mode, where the operator chooses the shutter speed and the camera figures out the optimum aperture to create a good exposure. This mode allows the operator to control the amount of time that the shutter is open, allowing them to have some control over the motion rather than the depth of field. The manual setting allows the operator to control both the shutter speed and the aperture while simultaneously displaying the meter's exposure value to give the operator the ability to choose exactly how the camera takes a picture. Manual mode requires that the operator pay attention to the meter in order to control the brightness and darkness of the image, while the two priority modes take care of this automatically. The camera has an interesting feature that allows it to balance the color of light that it records to best match our perception of the scene. White balance mode is essentially how the camera figures out what color the light is and how to record the image best so that it is the same as how we perceive the scene. To back up a little and start with the premise that light has color and there's different types of qualities too. The color of light in photography is referred to as the color temperature, and it can either be warm, cool, or neutral. We perceive these things, but for the most part, our brains tune out this fact that there is a color to the light. So when we look at things, we perceive them as the actual color that they are, and not the color that's influenced by the color of light that's on the things that is allowing us to see them. The white balance mode can be used to neutralize color casts caused by different colored light, or they can be used to enhance them as well. For the most part, the light we'll be encountering in the documentation process is daylight corrected LED bulbs. So the best setting to put the camera on for white balance is the daylight setting. Don't trust me though, take a test shot and evaluate your image to determine if you have the right balance setting for your camera. If you don't, you might wanna change it. Now with all of those things in place, we should be able to raise the camera to our eye Press the button halfway down to activate the autofocus and then press the button all the way down in order to take the photograph.
So as you can see, we're pretty much ready to take the photographs and we want to get ready to do our first few test shots to get our camera set properly. So let's do a settings review and go through all the features that we've talked about so far. The first thing you want to do, make sure the camera is working and the battery is charged. On the back screen, you'll see how many pictures you can take and you can decide if you need to clear your card or not. Next, you want to make sure that the camera is set to AV or Aperture Priority. Then you want to make sure that the camera is set to One Shot Autofocus and that the autofocus switch on the lens is turned on. Otherwise, you want to put it to Manual Focus should you intend to do manual focusing. I recommend autofocus. Finally, you want to make sure that the ISO is set to approximately 400 ISO and inside the camera it should be set to take RAW plus JPEGs. With all that set up and your aperture value set to somewhere in the middle, I would say start around f8, then you can test to see if your images are going to work and if your depth of field is appropriate. Now that our settings are set correctly on the camera, we should take our first few test shots. I like to work on a stool, it saves my back. The object that I have here is a small ceramic vessel with a handle and an obvious decoration point, which I'm gonna put right out front. Next thing I wanna do is set my camera lens to 55 millimeters. Hold the button that takes the picture halfway down and it'll start to autofocus. I can keep refocusing. I'm going to adjust my field of view, come down a little bit lower to try to be face on, and hold the button all the way down to take the photograph. Now, as you may have heard, that photograph took a 15th of a second to expose. So that's a little bit longer than I can reasonably hand hold. And it's important that I make sure that these photographs are still. So while that shows me that my photos look good, my white balance is good, the image looks good. If I zoom in, I'm gonna see that it's blurry and a little bit shaky from camera shake. So in order to properly document your objects, I recommend that you use a tripod for all of your shots because it allows you to control the composition very carefully, make small, minute adjustments to your composition. It holds the camera still and allows you to take a more efficient photograph. It might seem like it takes a little bit longer, but you're gonna to get to a better picture faster by using a tripod. So we've got a Manfrotto Be Free tripod here. They are a little weird because they come out of the, the case essentially upside down. So what you wanna do is rotate each leg around 180 degrees and still starts to look like a tripod and then there's little clips on the top that let you lock it so that the legs will stop at the right spot. Then you want to extend uh, one of the set of legs all the way out and that will allow you to set the tripod down and then you can carefully extend the other legs out without bending over or hurting your back. This is also how you're going to want to adjust the tripod legs for height. So if you need to move all of the tripod legs together, just unlock one set of adjustments and then you can lock each one up like that. And then I like to set the neck somewhere around the middle so that when I'm taking pictures, if I need to raise or lower the tripod, I don't have to move all three legs that I've got about six inches of movement on the neck itself. Now that the tripod's all set up, we're ready to take the plate off the top of the head. And there's a little tiny uh, catch right here and a lever that holds it on. And then we're gonna put the plate onto the bottom of the camera. The plate has a set screw on the inside of it that goes in pretty much like a bolt inside of a nut. So you're gonna use right, tight, left loose. In this case, we're going counter or clockwise to tighten it up and counterclockwise to take it back off. There is a little indicator on the bottom that says point the lens this way. And I like to put the narrow part of the tripod plate towards the lens so that when I put it into the tripod, 
head, it goes in like this and then locks down into place like that. Now you're safe to take the strap off. And that's it. We're ready to take some pictures. Okay, so we've got the camera set up on the tripod and we're ready to take our first few photographs. So what I want to do first now is set the camera to self timer and I'm going to put it on the two second timer so that it holds the camera and the tripod steady when it takes the photograph. Next I want to put it into a vertical orientation through the little notch on the side of the ball. Then I'm going to look through, adjust my photograph, and then lock the ball into place. And then I'm going to make one more adjustment to make sure that I've got the right height for the piece. One tiny little adjustment with the ball, locking it back in, autofocus, and then I'm going to back off, press the button, and there we go. So the reason why we want to use the self timer button is that it prevents this action where I shake the camera by pressing the button itself. So by pressing the button and it counting down, it has a chance to stop moving and hold the camera really steady for the photograph. So when you have more than one object of the same shape and size and dimension, you want to try to shoot them all together. So it saves you having to move the tripod around and come up with different uh, types of adjustments that you have to do. So I've got two mugs here and I'm going to switch out one mug for the other mug. And you'll notice that uh, sometimes they feel better in one hand or the other, or in this case, this had a left-handed uh, decoration on the front. So that kind of forced the handle onto the left hand. In this case, I'm going to set this mug up for a right-handed orientation because there's more right-handed people in the world. And I'm just going to make sure that the handle looks good and I'm going to try to put it in the same place. Now, I like to have the handle have a bit of a third dimension. So in this case I'm going to bring the handle out a little bit towards me. So then I'll recompose, focus, Now with this piece, it has a really interesting texture and uh, it doesn't read very well from the overall shot. So I'm going to take a moment to bring the camera in really close, refocus and try and do a detail shot that shows the quality of the mug. So I'm going to lock. Self-timer. Okay, so we have these great uh, paper-wrapped bricks that are designed to be supports for your artwork that needs to lean. So they just go in, and then you can stand up plates, uh, bowls, and other types of vertical objects like that. Generally, I like to shoot square things horizontally because they look better on the display screen when they're being shown for scholarships and applications. So, but when in doubt, because they're free, it doesn't take much effort to stop and shoot the other orientation as well. I'm going to shoot the vertical at the same time. There we go. That's it. Okay, with this next piece of sculpture, uh, it has to be shot horizontal, but the perspective is going to be really important. From this perspective, I have a bird's eye view, essentially like I'm flying above it. So in order to get the perspective to give this a monumental feel and to actually make it look like a monument, <clears throat> I'm going to lower down the camera so that I can look at this thing from the human scale, which would be at the same height or slightly above the ground level, something like this. The only problem that I have is that the edge of the background has 
crept into the corner. So that's a matter of the fact that I'm at 35 millimeters right now. So I need to back up, zoom in, and then do a little bit of readjustment to cut out the background. So that's going to collapse my field of view, narrow it, and allow me to eliminate the background without changing my perspective very much. It looks pretty good, but it also looks a little bit two-dimensional. It's quite flat because I can't see the top of the object. What that means is I'm going to have to back up a little bit more because I'm also seeing the front of the background. Hoping this is my last adjustment. So now I can see the top of the circle, which creates a bit of an ellipse. It gives the design a little bit more form. Now with the pile of larger two-dimensional work left over, make a pile that can be documented using a camera and a setup for shooting flat work. All of the work that is less than a meter wide can be photographed on a copy stand. A copy stand is a specialized device that holds the camera so that the camera can point down vertically, be adjusted quickly, and provides consistent, even lighting. The copy stand should be set up with the arms extended out as far as possible without a letting the lights get too low, which will show you the shadows and the wrinkles in your paper. The ideal angle is about 45 degrees to the surface of the board. The camera is mounted to the copy stand's head in a similar way to how the tripod plate is attached to the bottom of the camera. Make sure to keep the camera strap around your neck while you're mounting the camera to the copy stand. This prevents you from dropping it should you lose your grip. Once the camera is firmly mounted, check to make sure that it's level to the surface of the board. I like to use a board on the top of the stand to allow me to move the drawing around without actually touching it. And with a little bit of practice, you can adjust it with your knees. I prefer to start with the largest drawings first. This allows me to continuously move down and get closer and closer to the drawings. To set the stand up properly, move the head all the way up to the top zoom the camera in, and then look through the viewfinder and adjust your view until the image fits into the frame. This should help you reduce any of the camera lens distortions that happen around the wide angle portion of the lens. Make sure you focus each time and use the self timer to reduce any camera shake in your images. While it's faster and easier to photograph your drawings on the copy stand, if they fit on a scanner, you may get a better image from a scanner rather than your camera. And this is because the scanner can produce more image resolution than the camera can. If you have artwork that just doesn't fit on the copy stand or is so large that the edges are brighter than you want, then you may want to shift to working on an easel or on a wall. So if you have a painter's easel, they work really well for holding your artwork while you photograph it. If you place two lights on equal side, roughly the same distance apart and the optimum angle is about 45 degrees, you'll get fairly even illumination. The trick of using an easel support is that your artwork generally tends to lean backwards a little bit, which means you need to match the angle of the artwork so that your camera is perpendicular to the board. This prevents various types of distortions to your image that keeps your work square essentially. Using the painter's easel as a support for artwork works great for canvases, boards, and other types of artworks that are hard to hang on a wall. You can also use it to photograph large drawings if you put a support to hold your drawings, either with clips or tapes or thumbtacks or whatever you want. So essentially when you're taking photographs on an easel, you want to make sure that you're perpendicular to the board and I like to make sure that I'm zoomed in pretty close. So I'm at 50 or 55 millimeter on my camera lens to reduce distortion. And then <clears throat> you have to check inside the camera to make sure everything fits and that it's square. Otherwise you may be too tall, too much to the left, too much to the right, or too low. So you have to use your judgment. I have the camera set to a two second self timer so that I can press the button and it'll take the photograph.
If you don't have an easel, then you can use a wall instead. Simply install a hanging mount or a screw into the wall for your work, and you can set the lights up in a similar way to photographing with an easel. You can also pin your work onto the wall if there's room to crop out the pins from the corner of your image. It's a little bit easier to make sure that you're straight on when you're working with a wall because you can put your camera in the middle of the artwork and then that makes sure that you're dead center in the middle and then you just pull back straight and you can make sure that you're, uh, you're in the middle of the image and that should prevent any types of distortions to your image. So one of the things that I forgot to mention earlier is that if you're taking exposures and you're reviewing them on the back of the camera and you find that they're too bright or too dark, then there's a button on the camera that allows you to override the camera's exposure. It's the plus or minus button located on the upper part of the camera's options on the back. And so you hold down the plus or minus button and that will allow you to override the meter. If you take things to the plus side, you're going to brighten them. And if you take things to the minus side, you're gonna darken them. After you've made an adjustment using the exposure meter, you wanna make sure that you do a test shot to see how your image is going to turn out. So there, it's much brighter than it was before. So I'm happy I can continue with the rest of my documentation. The exposure compensation option is similar to the ISO option in that it stays locked in until you change it. So whenever you're finished uh, with your override uh, in your exposure, you wanna make sure you put it back to zero. This concludes this portion of the portfolio documentation process. When you finish taking all of your photographs, you'll have to download them onto a computer organize and label them into folders and groups, and complete the rest of the portfolio process. We will be demonstrating the rest of the portfolio process in other videos, so please stay tuned.